Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, another session of our quantum computation and high energy physics seminar. It's a great pleasure to welcome today Brian Swingle. Brian is Associate Professor of Physics at Brandeis University, and he's been one of the most prominent researchers trying to explore this interface between quantum information and gravity, which is a topic we also uh, want to explore in our seminar series. So thank you very much, Brian, for joining and for sharing these recent developments with us. Thanks a lot. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for coming out. And thanks for the very kind introduction. And yeah, today I want to tell you a little bit, just a glimpse of what is now a pretty big field, about the interaction between tensor networks and holographic models of quantum gravity. And I'll tell you, part of the story is going to be kind of maybe more familiar in this field. And then part of the story is more my personal interest, where we try to use try to take inspiration from ideas in quantum gravity to develop new computational tools for many body physics. So I think that kind of ties into both of some of this group's interests and I'll talk about both those things today. Um, the, the other important thing is that I, I'm obsessed with AI art. So this is a, a picture that I made using Midjourney here. I think this is like holographic universe in a bottle or something. So it's like a snow globe. And the, the qubits are on the outside of the globe, and they're generating this holographic interior. So it's it's pretty amazing <laughs> what these things can do. And I like to tell people I'm sort of basically just an AI art creator now, and a, you know, part time physicist. But um, let's get started. So let's just start by orienting ourselves. So I want to think of the kind of things I like to think about as being one of these frontiers of physics. So we're familiar with various kinds of frontiers at sort of large or small distances at very high energy or very high intensity. But there's also this exciting frontier at kind of high complexity or sort of macroscopic quantum physics. This is a frontier that's relevant for very complex quantum materials. It's relevant for simulators and quantum computers. It's potentially relevant in astrophysical scenarios at the very early universe, or if you're interested in the quantum properties of black holes. And it's also interesting because it, you know, it's just one more place where we might find some unexpected new physics. Um, and so it's always good to look out for that. And you know, my background is kind of uh, coming from strongly correlated electron physics. So that's where I started out my research life. And there we have all these exotic, interesting phases of matter. Here I've shown you two of them that I've thought a little bit about as a graduate student. Uh, fraction quantum Hall effect on the left and high temperature superconductivity on the right. And you know, these we understand fraction quantum Hall better than high TC superconductivity, but in both cases, there's a strong suspicion that what's underlying this physics is highly entangled phases of matter. And so this is one of the really interesting places where ideas of quantum information and uh, you know, potentially quantum computation can perhaps shed really new light on physics that we've thought about for a long time um, and really give us something, something new to, to think about these problems with. Okay. In this context, um, I became interested early on in tensor networks as sort of a language for um, this sort of mini body physics. And uh, in particular, I, I like to sort of explain it by analogy with Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams are this, you know, very prevalent tool that you can use productively when, say, you have a weak coupling or some sort of expansion parameter. And tensor networks are similarly sort of a language or a tool that you can use whenever you understand something about the way entanglement or correlations are structured in your state. So if you have enough understanding of that, or you have some expectation that entanglement is not too large or has a certain pattern, then tensor networks provide a potentially useful language to think about the physics. I mean, they're totally general, just in the sense that you know you you can represent anything with these networks in principle. But they're you know most useful when we have some sort of principle like low entanglement that you know makes them uh, sort of practical tools. Okay, but they're both computational tools as well as conceptual tools. For example. In many body physics, they've been used to classify phases of matter, as well as provide computational tools to actually calculate the properties of individual Hamiltonians. And so it's just a really very powerful framework that I think, you know, is 
is relatively new on the scene, comparatively speaking, and you know has a lot of promise. And I think in this in this in this uh, group, you've heard about tensor networks from the point of view of simulating field theories or lattice regulated field theories as well. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. Now, one thing about tensor networks is that you know it's really a very general class of things. There's lots of kinds of architecture. A very general parameter, which I'll talk about later on, is called the bond dimension, which just tells us kind of how big our tensors are, basically, how many variational parameters we have, or how many degrees of freedom we have in the tensors. And then we can glue these elementary units up into various patterns. For example, this is a configuration matrix product state that you might use to describe a one-dimensional system. Here is a projected entangled pair state that you might use to describe a two-dimensional system. And then on the left, on, on the far right here, I have uh, something called a DMERA, stands for Deep Multi-Scale Entangled Normalization Ansatz. And this is a tensor network that you might use to describe, for example, a scale invariant one-dimensional system where there's some sort of long-range correlation. So for example, a, a lattice model that has somewhere in its phase diagram a critical point, a quantum critical point, in which it might be described at long wavelengths by some field theory. Okay. And especially in 1D, these tools have been really powerful. They've, you know, made a made a big impact in higher dimensions as well, but somehow there the computational problems of just working with these objects is like much more challenging. So, you know, definitely progress is being made, but it's it's harder. But especially in 1D, I think these are kind of, you know, the gold standard methodology for lots of different problems. And there's a very huge literature here, which I don't have time to even begin to to talk about. But yeah, this is kind of you know where I came into this problem um, that I'm going to tell you about next. So with that background, let me ask the question, you know, what, what about gravity? I, I, I as I said, I'm kind of a mini body person. So I'm happy to view field theory as sort of some continuum limit of a mini body system. And in that sense, you know, I think of field theories or at least lattice regulated field theories as you know, potentially very much also being amenable to this sort of approach. But, you know, gravity may be really different, potentially. And so, what you know, what about gravity? We have a very successful theory, as I'm sure you all know, general theory of relativity. And this theory passes all kinds of checks and makes all kinds of, you know, amazing predictions. Um, but there is this famous problem, which we call the problem of quantum gravity, which is roughly just combining the sort of the physics of quantum theory with the physics of general relativity. And there's various reasons why this is mysterious, but uh, this is a central problem in theoretical physics. It will, you know, potentially one day be a problem in experimental physics, but we don't yet really have experiments that probe this, um, this quantum nature of gravity. But it's definitely a very clear problem in theoretical physics. And it's one that's been, I would, for my personal view, very illuminating to think about. Okay. And the point of view I'll take in this talk you know, just sort of one way into this problem is to think specifically about black holes because black holes are kind of a place where you're really forced to confront in a very strong way the differences between quantum field theory and quantum gravity because you have this very strong warping of the space-time and a significant reorganization of the structure of the degrees of freedom. And so for this reason, black holes have been uh, have been a very fruitful place to think about this physics. And uh, on the right here, I have you know, this famous data from LIGO where they observe this black hole merger, the first merger, and they observe the ring down, which is this final part here. So you know, we're in this new exciting era of like really directly imaging you know, gravitational waves from black hole mergers and other exotic objects. And so it just feels like a good time to think about this. So again, what's the point of view? The point of view is that black holes can be viewed as some sort of quantum mini body system with a very large number of states in this quantum mini body system. And moreover, it's a system which is what we might call chaotic or thermalizing. It relaxes to equilibrium. And the characteristic time scale of that equilibrium relaxation when expressed in kind of quantum units is actually a relatively short time scale associated with the thermal time. Okay, and it's kind of amusing fact that the entropy that you get here, this famous Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is really, really large. So 
for these supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, this entropy can be far in excess of all the entropy in the visible universe. So if you're sort of thinking in terms of entropy, if you're an information theorist, you know, black holes should be your main concern and everything else is a small correction. Okay, so the plan with this kind of motivation in place is to tell you sort of two short stories. One is kind of how tensor networks have helped us understand aspects of what I'll call holographic quantum gravity, which I'll define in a moment. And that'll be sort of a kind of high level overview of some earlier work that I did, these two papers here. And then I'll mention in a little bit more detail, a recent work with a postdoc, Greg Benson, and a former postdoc, Shao Kai, who's now junior faculty at Tulane. And then in the second part, I'll talk about some ways in which this quantum gravity idea has kind of inspired us to think about new sorts of practical algorithms that you might actually be able to just implement to learn about sort of ordinary many body physics. And you know, this is sort of, if you like, a cousin of the idea of using ADS CFT to you know, make some sort of black hole model of superconductors or symmetry breaking phases of matter. There was, you know, that's a program that's still going on. And here we're not trying to match any particular precise black hole, but more like draw some generalizable lessons from the way holography works to, you know, using the connection of tensor networks to then make some more generally applicable tool to address this physics. So there I'll talk about two recent papers, one with Chris Sinochi, who's currently a PhD student at MIT, who works with me a little bit. And then a, a very recent work with Troy Sewell, who's a PhD student at the University of Maryland, and Christopher White, who's a postdoc there. And this will be about dynamics, about transport, energy transport. So something that we really care about in solid state condensed matter physics, but also, you know, for purposes of say, computing hydrodynamic coefficients in the quark gluon plasma. We'd love to be able to do that. And then the second one is about preparing low temperature states. Okay, so that's the basic plan. Um, and I can take any questions if there's anything about this basic setup that, that you'd like to ask. Otherwise, we can move on to, to part one. Okay, so here's another, um, here's another one of my favorite images. <laughs> this is uh, what you get if you work with statistical interpretation of a holographic universe. And I really find it like extremely amazingly accurate. You have like what I want to think of as qubits or little patches of space, little degrees of freedom all on the boundary of my sphere. And somehow it's the entanglement or correlations between these degrees of freedom that are giving rise to this space time in the middle where you know you can have stars and all kinds of other interesting objects. Okay, so in that spirit, the way I like to make progress in this field, because it, in particular because it connects to many body physics, is to think about this very concrete model of quantum gravity called the antidesider space conformal field theory correspondence, or ADS CFT. And the idea of this correspondence is the following you have on the left a sort of ordinary, quote unquote, quantum system, a quantum field theory, say, in one space and one time dimension. And on the right, that's the red sort of skeleton. And on the right, you have uh, this bulk higher dimensional geometry where the geometry is fluctuating, it's dynamical. And Newton's constant or the analog of Newton's constant in this universe is now non-zero. So here you have gravity, you have dynamical space-time which fluctuates, which has quantum fluctuations, which can respond to matter and energy. And on the boundary, you have this kind of rigid skeleton. And the claim of ADS CFT, Maldesena's claim, is that these are really equivalent descriptions of the same physics. Okay, so this boundary theory is like a microscopic encoding of the bulk quantum gravity. So we refer to this as the boundary, this is the bulk. And the idea is like the soup can, the label kind of tells you what's inside. That's the, you know, one line cartoon. And this is a really nice setup because although our world is not anti the sitter space, which is the kind of space time you get most easily here. Um, it still has black holes, it still has gravitational waves, so you can hope in principle to use this as a nice theoretical laboratory to investigate problems in quantum gravity, even if the ultimate theory that describes our universe is not going to be exactly of this type. 
Okay, so far as we can tell from experiment. And so, you know, the first question you can ask in this setting is, you know, where does this space come from, right? We have this emergent bulk region, which kind of somehow is encoded holographically in a lower dimensional boundary. But what is that representation? And my idea back in 2000, I guess, uh, eight or nine, is that we should think of this bulk geometry, which is, has this hyperbolic structure here, as being analogous to a tensor network, actually, which is encoding the quantum state of the boundary degrees of freedom. And so in particular, I said that the boundary is a field theory. It's a conformal field theory. That means it has scale invariant correlations. So it has correlations at all scales. It has entanglement at all scales. And therefore, you would expect one of these scale invariant tensor networks to be the appropriate tool to describe that physics. And so here's such a network or, you know, adapted to, uh, to this circular hyperbolic geometry. You can sort of view it as hyperbolic because if you count the number of nodes as you go sort of in, they're decreasing exponentially. So you can think of it as like a renormalization group picture of the quantum state where you're sort of integrating out or somehow removing degrees of freedom as you move inward. And so the out part, outer part of the diagram is really the UV and the inner part is the deep IR. And that, you know, roughly matches actually how ADS-CFT works. Okay. But the connection is better than that because in, in ADS-CFT, there's a very fundamental rule. It says, if you want to know how much entropy is in a region of the boundary, specifically what's the binomial entropy of that boundary, then the rule in the, in the simplest case, there, there are elaborations of this, but the simplest rule is that you look at the edge of your region, that, that is this point here and this point down here, and you draw all the curves in the bulk that touch those two endpoints. And then you select the minimum area, or in this case, minimal length curve. And the length of that curve in Planck units is the entropy of this region. So it sort of generalizes the famous formula that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its area to some sort of more general thing where we're really computing like entanglement entropy in principle of this region. It's the degree of entanglement with the rest of the system in terms of this minimal curve in the bulk. And if you go to the right to this tensor network point of view, then this is also roughly, roughly what you get. More specifically, what you get is a bound, which says that the total amount of entanglement that can exist between these degrees of freedom in red and the rest is upper bounded by the number of bonds you cut, in particular the minimum number of bonds you cut, times the log of the bond dimension. So if you think of the bond dimension as sort of like encoding the Planck length, then each of these links is some kind of like Planck cell worth of degrees of freedom. And uh, you know, you're cutting some number of links and the minimum number is the tightest bound you can have. And then in that case, you're sort of reproducing schematically what you have in ADS-CFT, including the hyperbolic character of the geometry and so forth. And you, know, you can go further than this. Like you can actually make particular models of these tensor networks where these tensors are particular kinds of special objects like random tensors in this paper here, or special kinds of uh, tensors that are called perfect tensors or maximally, absolutely maximally entangled tensors, which are discussed in this paper here. And in that case, you can even prove at the level of the graph that you have, say, this kind of connection between entropy and the min cut, okay? And then once you have those networks, you can do a lot of things. For example, one of the big questions we wanna know in ADS-CFT is how are different parts of the bulk encoded in the boundary? And one of the basic rules is that you can derive is that if some particle is contained between the boundary and this minimal area surface or minimal length surface, then that particle is sort of reconstructed or knowable from this boundary region. And that's again, something you can prove in these tensor network settings, well, you know, and, uh, and you can gain further insight into the way this reconstruction works, what are the conditions for it and all these kinds of things. Uh, now you, you can also make black holes, as I said. These hey, hey Brian, can I ask a please? Can I ask a question, please? Um, so, uh, like the 
Escher print on the left, uh, it corresponds to a particular tiling of, of uh, hyperbolic space, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, my question is that uh, the tensor network on the right, does that also correspond to a tiling? Does that, does that give us any particular tiling or is it? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are yeah, good, good question. There, there are different ways of constructing this, but like, for example, in these so-called happy codes, which is this paper here, th these are based on explicit tilings where you use mm -hmm. different kinds of polygons to tile. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, Thanks. so the answer is yes, but there, there are lots of variations of this story. So this is kind of just the high level picture. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can also have black holes and what black holes look like now, this, this empty space here is like corresponding to the ground state of the CFT, the lowest energy state. Black holes then correspond to thermal states where you've excited lots of degrees of freedom. And here's a black hole, there's the boundary. And now sort of once you go deeper enough inside, you encounter the horizon. The geometry is also warped in some way. And this again sort of makes rough physical sense if I think of the radial direction as being analogous to energy scale, it's saying I kind of go in, go in, go in, go to lower and lower scales, and eventually I reach a scale set by the temperature. And once I've reached that scale, then something qualitatively different happens. That's the black hole. You can also do that in an tensor network, say by erasing part of the network and putting in, for example, maximally mixed states into all these inputs. And then you can do the same kind of entropy calculation. And now you see that your minimal curve can do things like hug the horizon. And this is how you see that the entropy of this region includes something sort of like entanglements, which you might associate with these kind of pieces that go from the boundary to the black hole, as well as some thermal entropy, which really comes from the part of the curve hugging the horizon. And in the network, we also have such an interpretation and so there's, again, a strong similarity between these things, and you can make this you know, similarity more precise in various cases when you make these tensors more precise. Okay, so let me keep going. Um, another thing you can think about is to ask about dynamics in these states. We've got our black hole, now how does the black hole evolve? Well, it turns out from the outside point of view, it doesn't do much of anything is it's an equilibrium state. But if you look at the inside of the black hole, then something interesting happens. And what does it mean to look at the inside? Well, one thing you can consider in ADS CFT is not a single CFT, but two of them. And you can consider an entangled state between these two CFTs, a so-called thermophile double state. And what this state is doing is it's like a minimal heat bath for one CFT in terms of another CFT. So it's literally, in the quantum information language, a purification of the thermal state of one, where you use the upper CFT as the purifier. And rather remarkably, this has an interpretation in ADS-CFT as a, actually a wormhole geometry or a maximally extended black hole spacetime, where you actually have two asymptotic regions. Here's the left, here's the right. This is the radial direction that we were showing before. Now I'm showing time and suppressing the transverse space. And you have an actual spatial wormhole where you go from the left through this spatial wormhole to the right. And so again, the entanglement between the left and the right is really what we would say is responsible for generating this space-time connectivity. Right. You also have these horizons, which are the black hole horizons. And the reason why you can't talk between the two, between the left and the right, is because if you send a signal anywhere on the left here, it's always bounded by the speed of light. And so inevitably goes up and crashes into the singularity. So this picture also includes the fact that you can't use entanglement to communicate unless you also couple the two sides. So many very natural things in quantum theory are sort of reproduced at this geometrical description in a very appealing way. Okay. And now we can ask the question, you know, suppose yeah, this is just a picture showing how they're related. So if I start here at the boundary and go to the black hole, then I start at the boundary and I just go into this so-called bifurcation point here. And then I could go back out again and I would just have another copy of this thing. So it really looks like this. If I start at this sort of equal time points, I go through and this is what the spatial geometry looks like. I kind of go in, I hit the black hole horizon, then I immediately go out again. 
if you now go forward in time, you ask how this thing evolves. Well, the outside doesn't really look any different because it's equilibrium. But if you take into account the fact that this is an entangled state of the composite system, then that state does evolve in time. And there's a signature of that in the geometry, which is that if you look, say, at a minimal, at a, at a maximum volume slice or some kind of geodesic, which cuts from the left to the right, that slice looks like this. It has the appearance of our two outer regions plus a tube that connects them. And this tube grows with time. So the more I push time up on the left and the right, the longer this tube in the interior grows. And so the interior of the wormhole is literally growing with time. This is what people refer to as the growth of the interior. And one of the big questions in the field was, what is the meaning of this growth? What does this correspond to in the field theory? Because this growth continues for a very, very long time, long after you've reached, say, entropic equilibrium and so forth. And the idea is that here's our thermofield double state. What this growth is, it's really the growth in the complexity of this state. So this state has growing complexity. It's getting more and more complicated. It takes more and more gates to produce it, more and more elementary operations. And this growth of the interior is literally encoding this growth of complexity. And from this point of view, the rough expectation you should have from the sort of CFT expect the point of view is that you have a certain number of degrees of freedom, the entropy, which are computing or active, and the clock speed of these degrees of freedom is set by the scattering time, which is essentially the inverse temperature. That was what we saw all the way back before that the natural time scale in the black hole is set by the temperature. I've put H bars and Cs and so forth to one here. And so you would naturally sort of have number of degrees of freedom times clock rates as your rate of growth of complexity, like the number of gates you're applying per unit time. And I'll just flash this because I don't want to talk about it in detail, but there's now all kinds of proposals for how to actually measure quantitatively this so-called complexity in terms of the volume of the wormhole or the action of the wormhole or other measures, space-time volume. And these rather fairly natural prescriptions typically reproduce this CFT expectation. They give you some number times TS or some number times the mass of the black hole, which is also of order TS. And these also pass, so this is the action prescription. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this in detail. They also pass some consistency checks. For example, there are things you can do to these wormholes called shock waves that correspond to applying Heisenberg operators. These shock waves calls like partial cancellations in the network. And these complexity equals volume, complexity equals action proposals, they actually reproduce this. So that cancellation is visible there and matches what you would expect from the tensor network. And so you really have like actually a picture where in this region on the left, you have our sort of renormalization group Mara-like network. On the right, you have a similar network. And that's role of this network is to sort of renormalize from the UV to the IR. And then in the IR, you have some active degrees of freedom, which are just computing or scattering or interacting in some chaotic fashion. And that corresponds to a quantum circuit of some depth, which is given by how long you evolve for the time, and a, a sort of width or cross section given by the number of degrees of freedom. And that is like essentially exactly what you get with these uh, complexity proposals in gravity. Okay, so I think this interior discussion, it, it really drew very heavily on the tensor network interpretation. And of course, you know, now it's, it's you know, not so dependent upon that. It's like there's other points of view, other ways of thinking about complexity in field theory, which might make contact with this. But the tensor network discussion was certainly very inspiring for, um, for making this work, for having this picture. And in fact, this, this led to a really a, the, the generation of a conjecture, um, which is that for sort of generic quote unquote chaotic systems, which I, I won't define, but one could define in various ways, which we view black holes as being one of, the complexity of time evolving state generically, we expect to grow linearly with time until it reaches 
some exponentially large maximum value. And Brown and Susskind have talked about this in great detail. They have a whole sketch or conjecture for what the complexity should look like as a function of time. I'm just talking about this early time growth region here where it grows linearly. And um, this has you know, become a major open question in the field to sort of understand and establish this property and see how it relates to other measures of chaos. And I'll just mention that in this recent work with uh, my postdoc, Greg, and my former postdoc, Shaokai, we actually were able to show this is the case um, for a class of so-called random circuits. So you replace a Hamiltonian of the black hole with a Hamiltonian with time-dependent random coefficients. This randomness gives you a lot of extra analytical control over the, the problem. And by computing a measure of randomness, which is called the frame potential, we were actually able to show at sort of physics level of rigor that these class of ense this ensemble of random circuits actually does have a complexity that grows linearly with time. Specifically, what we can show is that if you want to reproduce the kth moment of the Haar measure to very high accuracy, this can be done in time linear in k. Okay. And I'm happy to talk more about this, but this is just kind of a, a side comment of, of sort of telling you where is the state of the art from the quantum information point of view right now in this growth conjecture. There's also a very nice work from, uh, um, from Jonas Hofferkamp and Nicole Younger Halpern and others showing other kind of linear growth results for some exact notion of complexity. So there's a lot of exciting activity happening in this area right now. Okay. Uh, Brian, yes. How how are we defining complexity here? Good. Um, so, you know, there there is a sort of brute force notion where we just counting gates. Uh huh. And here, just by a counting argument, you can show that in order to form like very you know, to form a K design, you need which means you reproduce the K moments of Har, you mm -hmm. need a certain number of gates. Right. Um. So that's one notion, and that was sort of the old fashioned, let's call it the original notion of complexity in this setting was that we would think of this complexity growth here as like, we're just laying down more gates in our tensor network or more tensors in our tensor network. Right. Um, uh, yeah. So it's a kind of circuit complexity? Circuit. Yeah, it's a circuit complexity. Yeah. And when you said it grows as TS, what, what is TS? Yeah, so here, yeah. so T is the temperature and S is the entropy. Right, okay. So we're thinking of S as the number of qubits and T is the, basically the rate of applying gates. Right. Sorry, I have a question also. Thank Please. you. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Um, I want to know, uh, because you are uh, considering uh, uh, really the black hole as a quantum system, uh, then we know, uh, and with gravity, we know that the, there is the problem of uh, definition of time and so on. Therefore, uh, the time that you are using as, uh, for instance, uh, the, for evolution of the, the um, of the complexity and anything else, which type of uh, time it is? Uh, is it, uh, do you consider a separate uh, um, clock and uh, it's for instance, a sort of page, uh, page, uh, Wouter's time or, or just a sort of classical time without going to the details? Yeah, good, thank you for the question. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so indeed there are many notions of time. And here, what I'm doing is I'm evolving with a physical, you know, diffio invariant notion of time associated with the boundary. So that's one of the reasons why ADS CFT is a bit easier to deal with than other kinds of quantum gravity, because we have this absolute notion of time on the boundary, at least, that we can use to help us. And so here I really have physical time evolution for the boundary CFT. And that really, you know, in quantum gravity, we would, we would think of that as being associated with all the physics in this entire weeder de Witt patch. And so then there are different ways of taking the physics of this patch and associating a complexity with it. So a proposal that, that I helped pioneer is this complexity equals action, which says we calculate the gravitational action of this whole patch. And that's measuring the complexity. 
um, in this other CV proposal, we calculate the the volume of this minimal or this maximum volume slice, and that's measuring the, the complexity. But the time is really this boundary time. And then, you know, there are deep questions about, suppose you don't change the boundary time, but you move this slice in the bulk. So like, imagine you deform it up into the black hole and then back down. What does that correspond to in the CFT or how do we understand that? And that's a, you know, ongoing subject of research. Thank you. Okay. So for me, I sort of view this as, as the, the takeaway here is that, is that not only is quantum theory and general relativity not in tension, actually entanglement, complexity are all essential ingredients in the way that space-time emerges from the boundary description, at least within ADS-CFT. Entanglement is intimately tied to the geometry of minimal surfaces and complexity is intimately tied to volumes and the growth of the interior of the black hole, right? So it's really kind of exciting that not only is there not really a tension, but they seem really very closely linked, okay, at least within this class of, of theories. And tensor networks have played an important role. I mean, I have a lover's eye, but I think they've played an important role in this discussion. Okay, so now let me talk about move on to part two in the little bit of time left. And in part two, what I want to talk about are a seemingly different topic, which is using tensor networks as sort of a tool to deal with low energy dynamics. Um, but as I hope you'll sort of see, there's actually a lot of inspiration coming from the gravity story in the way we think about this. Okay, so let's talk now about what, you know, what are the issues here? So suppose we have some many body system and we're interested in dynamics of that system at energy scales far below the microscopic scale. So you have a Hamiltonian, say on a lattice with some microscopic energy scale in it or some lattice constant. And you wanna look at physics at energies or times, energies much lower than that scale or times much longer than the microscopic time scale. And the typical challenges here, you know, are, you know, first of all, there's just lots of degrees of freedom in the kind of systems I want to think about. We're talking about dynamic, which is which is already a hard problem, and it's typically multi-scale, right? We're interested in some small scale compared to the naive UV scale, so we have to address that that multi-scalar separation of scales feature of the problem. And you know, there's a lot of theories or tools that we can use to, to try to approach this. You know, one. Very nice tool are solvable models, including perturbations. So for this, you know, a famous example here would be free particle models with some weak scattering. Then you might have a kinetic theory interpretation, a quantum kinetic theory, or Boltzmann-like interpretation. We can also speak in terms of effective theories like hydrodynamics. There, typically the challenge is computing the coefficients that enter this effective theory. So we like, we know that the dynamics is effectively classical on long scales, but figuring out what the diffusivity is or what the sound speed is can be a hard problem because it requires kind of matching the effective theory to the underlying quantum theory. What I'll discuss here is the use of these entanglement-based methods like tensor networks specifically to make progress on this problem. But this is a little bit surprising because there is a famous problem with tensor networks when you think about dynamics called the entanglement bottleneck or entanglement barrier. The idea here is that if you, again, have some sort of chaotic system, then what you expect to have happen is that the system generates lots of entanglement. In our black hole case, we were adding lots and lots of gates. Those gates are going to generate entanglement between all the different parts of the system. So we're building up lots of entanglement. The bond dimension in my tensor network is limited by the amount of entanglement I have. It's limited by the entropy. And so if I have entropy, which is growing very rapidly, then the bond dimension, which is roughly like the Schmidt rank of my state, the approximate Schmidt rank, you know, that's also going to grow super rapidly. So I'm going to quickly run out of computational power. No matter how big my computer is, it's just hopeless. But sort of as we already hinted in various ways, if we understand the entanglement structure of these problems with enough insight, we might find ways around this. 
So one famous idea is to, instead of look at unitary evolution, look at open system dynamics. So like master equation dynamics or a system coupled to a bath. And there, because it's open system, it's, you know, typically you would expect just generically that there's going to be less entanglement because it's coupled to a big classical heat bath. Right. But even though you have less entanglement, it's not going to modify the transport physics. Right. This is some like coarse grained property of the system. It doesn't matter if I'm looking at the motion of charge in an isolated plasma or if I've coupled that plasma to, you know, some bath, the diffusivity should be the same or at least approximately the same. There are also ideas where I can say, let me coarse grain, right? I have all this entanglement, but this is like very fine grained entanglement. It's not directly related to the simple physics, say this transport physics that I'm interested in. So perhaps I can have a process whereby I, you know, take a highly entangled pure state and replace it with a less entangled mixed state, which is still capturing all of the coarse grain physics I care about. And so in this way, I could sort of have a sort of coarse grain dynamics, which for which the coarse grain state is always low entanglement. And then I could again, solve the problem using my tensor network technology. Okay. I'll talk here about open system approach, but these others are also interesting. Um, so here's the kind of setup you might have in mind. You can, uh, Think about a master equation, we have Hamiltonian and then some jump operators or Lindblad operators. And I wanna just think about like a wire, one dimensional wire with two baths at either end, a T left and a T right, these are again temperatures. And so if I apply a temperature gradient, then I'm gonna gener generate an energy current or heat current through this system. And if it's a sort of ordinary system, chaotic system, then this current should be typically a diffusive current. So there would be an energy diffusivity I'd like to extract. And the idea, as I kind of intimated, was that we want to think of this situation as like in local equilibrium, in which case the effective state is some sort of slowly varying thermal state inside the wire. It's thermalized by these baths. And such a state, you might imagine, has relatively little entanglement compared to some unitarily evolving pure state which is becoming very highly entangled. And this is one place where the black holes come to the story because this is an intuition that actually I personally got, just speaking the way it happened for me. This intuition came partly from the black hole problem because the way that you can describe these hydrodynamic states and black holes is in terms of our original setting with the boundary and the black hole horizon, but where the horizon is now sort of bumpy. And that bumpiness encodes, encodes sort of a locally variable temperature and can encode currents and flows on that horizon. And one thing you can do is take this description using the rule I told you before, the Ryutaki Nagi rule for entropy, and you can show that these kind of states within ADS-CFT have very nice properties. For example, they form what are called approximate quantum Markov chains. And such approximate Markov chains can be represented as tensor networks. So this is kind of what I meant when I said we're not using any very particular feature of the black hole, but we're trying to extract a generalizable lesson. So here we're not using the particular theory so much as just saying that for this big class of systems, in this big class of hydrodynamic states, we would expect the relevant states to have some nice information theoretic property, which we can translate into a useful tensor network representation of that physics. Okay. You could, of course, come to this idea other ways, but this is one of the ways that I came to it, and I found it uh, very inspiring. Let me just skip this. You can you can figure out what the temperature is and just go to kind of the, the result. So let's talk yeah. about yeah. Can I? Uh, so um, does that uh, basically give you a mechanism for identifying? Uh, black hole-like states in a tensor network? Well, yeah, I, I would say we already kind of understand what it would be the candidates of black hole states, which are just thermal states. But this might be a way of trying to describe like hydrodynamics, hydrodynamic states in a tensor network as well. 
right, but right. yeah, exactly how close okay. you can get to this picture no, no, is, a, I mean, you know, is a question. Okay, I mean, I, I didn't know if there was an explicit construction of a of a, of, of a tensor network state which corresponds to a to black hole geometry. Yeah, I'll actually talk about this just at the very end. So if you, sure, sure, sure. if sure. you, uh, I'll wait. <laughs> ask your question again, then then I can do a better job of answering. Okay, so let's just take a simple point model. This is just what we did. Uh, this is with work with Chris Zanocci. We consider a one-dimensional chain with that open system set up, and this one-dimensional spin chain had the property that there's an energy gap which doesn't vanish in a thermodynamic limit. So what we would expect at, at low temperature, low compared to the gap, is that you have a very dilute gas of particles, and these particles are colliding. Now, if you use energy and momentum conservation in 1D, you can learn that two-body collisions can't relax energy current, so you have to use three-body collisions. And so you would expect for this dilute gas of weakly interacting particles, based on kinetic theory, that the diffusivity, the energy diffusivity would go like the velocity of these particles, which is just square root of T, that's the classical ideal gas, and then the density squared in the denominator because you need three particles to collide to relax the energy current. And so, you know, just based on kinetic theory, there's a very nice expectation of what the diffusivity should be as a function of temperature. And now we can ask if we apply this open system logic using a tensor network to solve the master equation, can we re reproduce this physics? And the answer is remarkably that we can. So here is a plot for this particular spin chain, which is called a transverse field or a mixed field Ising chain. There's an Ising interaction and two magnetic fields. If you turned off this Z term, it would be integrable, but with the Z term, it's non-integrable or chaotic. These are the parameters we chose. And what I'm showing is the diffusivity on the y-axis is a function of one over the temperature and units of the gap on the x-axis. So you see at very high temperature here, you get some order one value. That's at the UV scale. But then as you lower the temperature much below the gap, you see this very rapid growth in the diffusivity. The circles are the results of our numerical calculation using that tensor network plus open system dynamics. And this solid line is the prediction from kinetic theory. And we're, we're not fitting the gap here. We're actually taking the gap just from numerics. We just look at a like size 12 system, compute the gap, plug it into this formula. We don't even need to fit the power here. It turns out just fit the overall coefficients and you can reproduce this line. Okay, so maybe the message here is not that this particular system is so interesting. I sort of, I think it's a pretty straightforward to understand the physics here the, from this kinetic theory, but that we have this principal tool, this tensor network tool, based on a low entanglement approximation or ansatz that lets us systematically obtain this result, right? And so now we could hope to apply this to some other situation where we don't have the kinetic theory control, but because it's principle, maybe we can still rely on it and we can compare with experiment or with other computational methods and actually have a tool for calculating diffusivity even at low temperatures in very large systems. I think here we're looking at, if I remember correctly, 100 sites or more. So this is a quite big system and it's all possible with this tensor network technology. Okay, the final thing I mentioned just in one or two minutes is what if you just want to prepare this low energy state period? So in the open system dynamics, I assumed that I had a bath, T left at some temperature, but how do you actually do that? In this calculation here, we just by hand construct jump operators that drive say a two site subsystem to thermal equilibrium at some given temperature. And we use that as the input, but that quickly breaks down if you want to go to lower temperature or a very large bath. And so you might ask the question, how do you, in general, do you construct thermal states at low temperature for some complicated interacting many body system? And one idea, which we just put forward on the archive a few months ago, what we call t mera or thermal mera. This is with Troy, Christopher, and myself. And the idea is going back to this RG-inspired network, the mera network here, where we have 
the interpretation of UV or microscopic degrees of freedom at the bottom, and then degrees of freedom here associated with lower energy, and then still lower energy, and then still lower energy. So what if we take that seriously and we say, let's associate thermal states with all of these bulk degrees of freedom, these degrees of freedom inside the network, and with a characteristic energy scale set by whatever the energy scale would be at that, at that level of the network. So we actually know what this energy scale should be. We could also try to determine it variationally by, by minimizing the free energy, say. But here we actually know the answer because we're doing, again, this Ising chain, but now in the integral limit. So we know everything about it. And in particular, we look at the critical point of this Ising chain where it's described by one plus one D Ising conformal field theory. We put in all these thermal states into this network here where the energy scales of these thermal states are determined by the appropriate scale of the network. In particular, they decrease by a factor of two at every step because you have a kind of relativistic scaling. So if you decrease the size of the space by a factor of two, you also decrease the size, the effective energy by a factor of two. And we can do this and we can get a result, which we can consider a very large number of qubits because it's integrable, so we can do it classically. Although in principle, we would also put this forward as a computational device for a quantum computer, where you could say to determine those parameters variationally. On the left, I show sort of the physics merit of, of success, which is the entropy versus energy. The dashed line is the actual Gibbs state, the truly correct answer. And these Ds refer to different depths in these circuits. So as you make the circuit deeper within each layer, you get better and better approximation. And if you go up to D equals six, which is, which is you know, relatively modest, you can get a very good approximation to the entropy. In particular, you can correctly reproduce the low temperature parallel entropy. This system has an entropy which is proportional to temperature and an energy proportional to temperature squared. And that's where you get this characteristic square root behavior here. You can also look at sort of the information theorist notion of success, which is the fidelity. And this is the fidelity as a function of temperature for this thermal state. And this again, 512 qubits. And you're seeing fidelity is on the order of at least 0.5 or 0.25 or better. I mean, so that's an insanely good fidelity for 512 qubits. Like that means that the whole mini body state is almost exactly what it should be, right? Normally you would expect the fidelity to be sort of exponentially suppressed in the number of qubits because every mistake on each qubit kind of adds up and heavily suppresses the fidelity. But here we're seeing that you kind of, kind of order one fidelity even for this very large number of qubits with a quite mod modest uh, depth D. Okay, and you know to come back to the black hole one more time, these interior qubits are like almost maximally mixed. And so for the purposes of these qubits, these gates are doing nothing. They're just conjugating maximally mixed states. So they just disappear, they cancel with each other. And so it's really like the first parts of this, the inner parts of this network just effectively almost cancel out. And we're left with feeding maximally mixed states into some lines in a cutout of our tensor network. And that's precisely the picture that we had for our black hole description in ADS-CFT. So in fact, I kind of sketched out this idea in my first paper on the subject in 2008. It took us until last year to actually really work it out in detail in this, in this case. But it's another place where there's really like a black hole inspired, I would say, computational tool, but which we can then apply to free fermions and still get a reasonable answer, right? And so our suggestion in this work is that this is really a, a tool that, you know, you could apply in principle quite broadly to lattice models with conformal field theories or scale and grant field theories in the infrared, and that you might be able to get quite good approximation to the quantum state using this architecture. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Just to summarize quickly, in part one, I kind of told you how tensor networks are helping us understand the structure of ADS-CFT, which is a holographic kind of quantum gravity. And in particular, the bulk geometry really is intimately tied to entanglement and complexity. And then in the second part, I sort of changed gears, but tried to still show you how ideas from quantum gravity, the structure of black holes in particular, has inspired at least me to think about new kinds of sort of principled computational tools that we can then apply more broadly.
to all kinds of interesting many body systems in very challenging regimes, for example, dynamics at low energies and transport distance. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention and happy to take more questions. Thank you very much, Brian. This was a really beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Um, so there were already quite a few questions during the presentation, but we, we still have a few minutes for questions now. So anyone, please just go ahead. A uh, quick question, Brian. Yes, again. yes please. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, what kind of gates um, are we talking about in the uh, circuit to, you know, basically simulate either mini body problem or a black hole? Yeah, well, so for, for, for this for this case, yeah. here, say, we would we would in general expect general gates. Uh -huh. oh. However, here, because we benchmark this on the transverse field Ising chain, uh -huh. We can actually use this special subclass of free fermion gates. All right. Uh, so, so for this particular calculation, we're using this special subclass of so-called match gates, or in, in a fermion, in the dual fermion language, just Gaussian fermion operations. Mm -hmm. People have applied this. You know, people like Gifrey Vidal and Glenn Evanbly and many others have applied this architecture to interacting problems and found good agreement with known properties of say minimal model CFTs. Um, but you know, we have not yet benchmarked this particular structure on an interacting problem. Yeah. Have you have you applied this to like high energy physics, maybe QCD? I mean, you know, that's definitely present in my mind and I'd love to do it. The main yeah. issue is just that it's like the informal complexity is much higher like doing these computations in more than one dimension like right. all the physical principles are the same i think i really believe this yeah but it's just like a lot harder to work with okay you know these three or four dimensional networks you have to deal with the gauge structure which is another interesting but yeah. problematic issue so i think like one day we'll get there maybe with the help of a quantum computer yeah but for right now it's sort of still far away that's great thank you Brian. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I have also a question. Please. Okay, please go ahead. Um, considering that um, CFT, many of CFT models uh, are integrable and uh, a lot of things can be calculated analytically, uh, I wanted to know uh, which type of uh, benefit we can have from uh, using, for instance, a uh, tensor network or other sort of simulation or approximation methods. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so indeed, you know, the model we're benchmarking here is one such integral model. Now, it, it is not too hard in 1D to get in one spatial dimension to get models that are not integrable. For example, there are these recently discussed chiral clock transitions that have arisen in the context of Rydberg quantum simulators. And there, these are non-relativistic scale invariant theories. And so actually, and they're interacting, they have conventional energy diffusion. And actually understanding these is an open challenge. I mean, you can do like perturbative field theory calculations to two or three loops. People like Subir Sachdev and his students have done this. And people have done sort of what are called matrix product state calculations to estimate properties of the theory as well. But this kind of thing, which, which I, I believe should work, has not been attempted yet. So that's the kind of situation where you might really make good use of this 1D technology to really learn something new you didn't know before. And then more generally, in higher dimensions especially, then integrability becomes scarce. And, you know, just for... You know, just the two two plus one quantumizing model. We do not know, you know, how to calculate the energy diffusivity of that model at low temperature, or, or frankly, any temperature. But I think these technologies would work. But you probably need some computational methods development or a quantum computer to help you contract this network to really make progress. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. So we're really approaching the end of the time for the seminar unless there's a really quick question I want to give the opportunity um, yeah uh well oh, um, really quick please thanks i was i was hoping brian uh, he had said that near the end he would talk a little bit more about uh, black holes in the tensor network and 
Oh yeah, yeah, right. So let me just let me just go forgive the rapid motion of slides. Um, go back here. So I said this is like roughly what the tensor network is supposed to look like for the two-sided black hole geometry. It's like just the RG network cut off at some scale and then continued out again, flipped. If I go to this final picture here, this is actually what you get because these sort of deepest most bulk degrees of freedom are almost completely thermalized. They're, they have a natural energy scale, which is much lower than the temperature. So their state is almost maximally mixed. And this continues for all the degrees of freedom until you get up to the thermal scale. So like roughly speaking, all the degrees of freedom above the thermal scale are in their ground state, thermal scale being the temperature, and all the degrees of freedom with energy below that are maximally mixed, very, very crudely. And so what you would have is these unitaries when applied to maximally mixed states just annihilate each other. They conjugate to the identity. And so in other words, you can basically remove all these circuit elements up to the thermal scale. And what you're left is with the RG circuit kind of above the thermal scale, and then just a bunch of lines that connect to the conjugate network on the other side. So you're actually kind of reproducing the spatial geometry of your wormhole from this circuit based on the property that these kind of innermost lines are roughly canceling out. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, so this is based on that uh, basically that, that uh, growing tube picture. Yeah, I mean, so the, yeah, then if you wanted to do the tube, then what you would imagine is like you apply gates here to the UV. These get renormalized down to kind of the active degrees of freedom here. And then you have a growing kind of linear or rectangular region whose width is the number of active qubits, the entropy, and whose length is the time, but measured in the energy units at that scale, which is the temperature. But what if you wanted to describe a black hole without uh, talking about a wormhole connecting two different regions? I mean, what if you just wanted to describe a black hole the state of a black hole on a tensor network, on a single copy of a tensor network of the type you showed on that slide with MCS you're drawn. Right, yeah. So like on this slide here, let's talk about this. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of really like you just take this RG network and then you glue it to something else. Like what you glue it to depends on the state. So if this, is a, if this is a thermal state, you just glue it to a copy of itself and that would be the two-sided black hole. If this was some kind of micro state, like if this is a pure state, it just looks like a black hole, then you could imagine gluing something else in here. So it really depends on what you want to think about. And you know, th th this isn't in the literature, people have discussed this, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm just sort of presenting the simplest okay. version here. Sure, sure. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're now past the time. So I had some questions myself, but uh, let us close the seminar here and thank Brian again for this really great, very interesting talk. So thank you very much, Brian. We really appreciate yeah. your time and your yeah, really nice presentation. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if you want to ask anything else. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, maybe we can uh, do it offline so that we I mean, we close the seminar for those who um, want to leave, um, and and then we we can stay a few minutes more for those who want to stay, and we sure. can close the recording now to officially end. Okay, ah, but we need I need to um, uh, present some slides, right, Rafael? I was forgetting that. Yes, thanks a lot, Rafaela, for setting this up. So we'll announce soon the speaker, the speaker uh, in April, and uh, so this will the next session will be on the sec uh, the twelfth of April, so just two days before the World Quantum Day, which is celebrated on April fourteenth. Next slide, please. So I want to thank um, the colleagues in the organizing committee. So Andres Zambainis, João Seixas, Simone Montangero, and Saverio Pascatio, and also Rafaela and Matteo, the local organizing team, which is making sure all these things are working. And I guess there's this uh, slide regarding the World Quantum Day. So the World Quantum Day is a bottom-up initiative celebrating uh, all quantum science uh, on April 14th, but in fact, 
around April 14th. I think there's a Gaussian of events uh, from March to May with a peak around mid-April. So uh, please do disseminate and uh, um, you know organize your own initiative and submit it to worldquantumday.org. We'll be very happy to um, disseminate it. So thank you very much once again for your participation and see you next month. Thank you.